I don't know what happened to the internet in like the past, what, five years now? But something has shifted to cause everyone to become obsessed with lost media. I don't know if something was added to the water or some cosmic ray hit the earth or some other changes happened. But we are all so obsessed with preserving media and finding the media that has been lost. And I'm no different. I'm a part of this wave. And while sure, I love hearing about a lost TV pilot being found, or any further developments being made in the search for a lost Super Smash Bros. show, but what I'm more interested in is old lost media. Historic lost media. Anything that was created and lost hundreds or maybe even thousands of years ago. That's what today's video is about. These are 10 stories of historic lost media. But before we go any further, check and see if you're subscribed. Chances are you're not. Only like 2% of my viewers are subscribed. If you want to see more videos like this, subscribing and turning on notifications is the number one way of doing it. But enough talking. Let's discuss 10 cases of historic lost media. Doctor Who is one of the longest running and most important shows in popular culture. I've never seen an episode because I hate British people, but even so, I know a lot about the show just because of how much staying power it has had. The concept of the show revolves around the Doctor, a humanoid shapeshifter who travels time in a blue British police box. Since the show's inception in 1963, the Doctor has been portrayed by 13 different actors. And if I'm reading and understanding correctly, as each season comes to an end, the character of the Doctor's body usually reaches a point beyond being saved, causing them to have to regenerate into a new form entirely. The first actor to play the Doctor was William Hartnell, and some of the more famous adaptations include Matt Smith, Peter Capaldi, and of course, probably the most famous adaptation, David Tennant. In 2018, Jodie Whittaker debuted as the 13th Doctor, making her the first female incarnation of the character. She portrayed the character up until the end of 2022, when she regenerated back into David Tennant, making him the first actor to play two different incarnations of the character. He is the plan for a handful of specials before passing the torch on to Shudi Gatwa, who will portray the 15th incarnation of the Doctor. So all this sounds pretty interesting to me, and it sounds like something I might actually like to watch. So it's time to binge it, right? Well, I could, and you could too, but if we do, we aren't going to be able to watch the full series. Like we said, the show premiered in 1963, 60 years ago, and in this time, 871 episodes have been made, which is already making this a mountain of a task. But it's made even harder by the fact that 11%, 97 episodes, are missing. Between the late 60s and through most of the 70s, the BBC did not keep the master copies of their programming. They didn't see much value in filling warehouses with these old films and TV shows, so they would wipe the tapes to be reused later. This has caused a big chunk of the series to be lost, but episodes have been rediscovered since. Some episodes were found in other nations' film archives, some were found by private collectors, and some had their audio found, and then they had the scenes animated to fill the void. Like we said, 97 episodes are still missing, but although slowly, episodes are still being rediscovered. As I'm writing the script, Two lost episodes featuring the first Doctor were found by British film collectors, but they are hesitant to hand them over to the BBC, as they're afraid of the legal consequences of holding on the stolen property of the channel. The BBC has also announced further plans to animate these missing episodes. Speaking of revisiting these old episodes, the 60th anniversary, which is premiering the same day as this video, is going to feature Neil Patrick Harris as the Toy Maker, one of the Doctor's oldest villains, as he debuted in the first season, and three out of four episodes that feature him are a part of the 97 missing episodes. Enjoy the special tonight, Doctor Who fans. Let's hope more episodes are found in the future. If you watched my first historical lost media video, you'll remember me discussing how the age of works of media is the number one factor in causing them to go missing, like Sappho's lost poems. Sappho was born in 615 BC, nearly 2700 years ago. The Yongle Encyclopedia was written 800 years ago. These things are old, and that's what caused them to go missing. So you shouldn't be surprised when I tell you that the oldest work of fiction, the Epic of Gilgamesh, which was written in 2000 BC, 4,000 years ago, has some parts of it missing. Not too, too much, but some. The titular Gilgamesh was thought to be a king of a Sumerian city-state called Uruk, which is about 100 miles away from modern-day Baghdad and Iraq. The epic centers around his quest in finding immortality after he upset the gods. The text, which is scribed on the several clay tablets, was discovered in 1839 by British archaeologist Austin Layard. 
In the nearly 200 years since this, we suspect we currently have about two-thirds of the poem, and we are still missing parts of it today. In 2015, a museum in Iraq rediscovered 20 lines of the Mesopotamian epic, and this seems to be the newest discovery. We have to remember how old this thing is, and it's very likely that parts of the story were left out once it was scribed, causing the true extent of its loss to be unknown. Growing up, I have been incredibly fortunate to have not just my grandparents, but I also had my great-grandparents. They were born in the 1920s, which meant they saw a lot of history happen. The Great Depression, World War II, the moon landing, they got to see this all in their lifetime. Something not as important, but was weird to me, was the fact that they were older than the characters of Batman and Superman. There was a time in their lives where they had no concept of a Batman or a Superman, and it wasn't like a few days or months or years even, they were young adults once the two characters were created. The character of Superman was first debuted as a part of Action Comics 1, which was released in 1938, but the character has a history before this. The creators of Superman, Jerry Siegler and Joe Shuster, first released a comic in 1932 called The Reign of the Superman. But the character of Superman in this comic is very different compared to the modern day iteration, in fact they're nothing alike. Superman in this comic is a homeless man named Bill Dunn, who is recruited by a scientist for an experiment. Of course, the experiment goes wrong, and Dunn becomes a telepath, who promptly becomes drunk with power and wants to take over the world. He accidentally kills the professor, but the experiment's effects were temporary, causing him to revert back to a homeless man. Yeah, nothing like our modern day Superman stories. But in that very same year, a story more similar to the Superman we know was made. After Rain was published, the two decided that Superman should be a hero and not a villain. The two were in contact with a publisher, and they had got hard to work with their new Superman comic. They had a full issue made, ready to go and be published. But unfortunately, the publisher pulled out, and no other publishers wanted the story, causing Siegler to throw the entire issue into its fireplace, forever destroying a piece of comic and pop culture history. The only thing that survives is a cover but Siegler and Schuster have revealed some details of the story. First of all, Superman was not an alien, and instead was a human vigilante who stalked rooftops and wore a cape, much like the later superhero Batman. This is all that's been revealed, and Superman collectors have worked tirelessly to find a copy to no avail. It's more than likely we'll never see it. Kai Sinat paid the phantom tax after he showed his Riz in Ohio. Was that funny, or even comprehensible? The answer probably depends on your age, as if there's something that's constantly changing its humor and slang. Like if I were to show this fire alarm to my grandma, she probably wouldn't think anything about it. But once you saw it, you probably shouted, oh my God. And then there's this dude, Chrysippus, 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 an ancient Greek philosopher who watched a donkey eat a bunch of figs and found it so funny, he laughed himself to death. My point is, different generations find different things funny, and humor shifts over time. So when I tell you the following joke, a dog walks into a tavern and says, I can't see a thing, maybe I'll open this one. That probably meant nothing to you. But if I were to travel 4,000 years back to ancient Mesopotamia and said it, they would have made me the king. As this is where this joke originated, and its meaning has been lost to history. Maybe. People have attempted to analyze this joke, and we believe we have found the meaning. I'll repeat the joke. A dog walks into a tavern and says, I can't see a thing. Maybe I'll open this one. People believe the punchline is that the dog walked inside the bar, but hadn't even bothered to open his eyes yet, so he couldn't see. Yeah, you get the rest. However, some alternate explanations have imposed. For example, the word tavern may instead have been referring to a brothel. And then the joke becomes the dog wants to go in and gawk at women. We don't know for sure. The Kelly Gang was a group of outlaws who operated out of Victoria, Australia, and it was named after Ned Kelly, who is probably best well known for his suit of armor that he wore during a shootout with the police in 1879. This was a crudely fashioned suit that was made of 6mm thick iron, and in total weighed 97 pounds, making it very cumbersome, but also very protective, as it successfully repealed at least 18 bullets. But 
His hands and wrists weren't protected, so as they were damaged, he began to bleed profusely, eventually leading to his capture. This story exploded in the late 1800s and early 1900s, in both Australia and in the global community as a whole. One such person who was inspired by the story of the Kelly Gang was Charles Tate, who went on to produce a film on the aptly named Story of the Kelly Gang. This was a silent era film produced in 1906 and followed the tales of the Kelly Gang, and ends with the infamous armored police shootout and one of the actual suits used in the shootout was used for the film. Once the film came out, it was an enormous hit, securing 25,000 Australian pounds at the box office on only a thousand pound budget. The film's one hour and 10 minute runtime caused it to be the world's first feature length film. As before this, movies were usually just parts of a show, Things were a lot more segmented back then. You would come and watch like four different things during one show, but this movie took up the entire runtime. As of 2023, roughly 17 minutes of the film remains. So what has happened to cause only about a quarter of the movie to remain? Well, like we've discussed before, film preservation back then wasn't a very reliant practice. Film back then wasn't seen as something that was going to last, so preserving these old films wasn't a priority. Plus, film canisters were produced on silver nitrate, a material that is very flammable and would degrade quickly, causing the mass loss of many silent era films, including the story of the Kelly Gang. Up until the late 70s, only about 30 seconds of grainy footage existed of the movie. The first discovery of additional footage happened in 1978, when 210 feet of the film was found in a film collector's collection. In 1980, more footage of the film was found in a garbage dump, which, side note, is kind of sad to think about how common this probably was. A lot of these old films were probably just thrown away. But back to the Kelly Gang, an additional 7 minutes was found and donated, and all of this footage found over the nearly 50 year search amounted to the 17 minutes that was digitally restored and released by the National Film and Sound Archive. As I've discussed in both my historical lost media iceberg, and in its own dedicated one, World War II saw a lot of historical art be stolen, destroyed, or otherwise lost entirely. The most famous story of this happening was the disappearance of the Amber Room, but the war also saw the loss of Portrait of a Young Man, Mask of a Fawn, and many other priceless artworks. Over on the Asian front, before the war had started, a massive discovery was made in Beijing, China. These were a set of about 200 fossilized remains of humans that were found in the Zalkonian Caves of Peking, China, which is now modern-day Beijing. They remained in China for about a decade, but they were going to be moved to the United States as the war was impacting China. They were loaded into a train, and that was the last time they were ever seen. A story kind of similar to this happened over in Europe during the war, but these weren't human remains that were lost, they were dinosaur remains, and we're going to cover the most infamous story. In 1912, German paleontologist Richard Margroff was on a mission in Egypt when he discovered a partial skeleton of a giant dinosaur. Once fully uncovered, it was named Spinosaurus. It was then moved to the Paleontogenes Museum in Munich, Germany. It remained here for about 30 years, and then World War II began to ravage the country. On April 24th, 1944, the RAF was leading a bombing raid against the city of Munich, and the museum was caught in the crossfire, and the original Spinosaurus skeleton was consequently destroyed. Unfortunately, these weren't the only fossils to be destroyed in the war, as fossils of the Aegyptosaurus, the Bajorosaurus, and the Carchundinosaurus and other dinosaurs with long-ass names were destroyed in World War II. As we mentioned with the Mesopotamian joke, if there's something that's changing on almost a daily basis, it's language. Now, of course, most of these changes are minute and don't really impact anything on a serious matter, but other changes are catastrophic to the language. Think of Latin, once one of the most spoken languages now only used in the Vatican City. But we, of course, have translations for Latin, and we're able to read and learn Latin, but the same cannot be said for Linear A. Linear A is a language that was used on the Greek island of Crete from 1800 to 1450 BC, a period of 350 years. The writing was first discovered in 1900 by Sir Arthur Evans. Since its discovery, no texts written in Linear A have been deciphered, partially thanks to how complex it is. Linear A has hundreds of signs, and a lot of them are unique to its language. What we know about Linear A comes from its successor language, Linear B, which was also found on the island of Crete. Like we said before, language evolves and changes, and it's shown here with the transition between the two.
Once a work that is so well loved comes to an end, fans clamor for more. Sometimes authors give in to the demand and continue to expand their universes, but once authors refuse to do so, that's where fan fiction steps in. It happens to every franchise, and the Bible is no exception. Throughout the Bible, several books are mentioned in the text, and these books are essentially biblical fan fiction, and they aren't taken very seriously. No matter how non-canonical and laughable these books are, you can still read them, except for one, the Book of the War of the Lord. This is a book that is only mentioned once, in Numbers 21, passages 13 to 14, and it reads as follows. From there they set out and camped on the other side of the Arnon, which is in the desert and bounding the Amorite territory. For Arnon is the border of Moab, between Moab and the Amorites. That is why the Book of the War of the Lord says, Will heaven supper in the ravines of Arnon, and at the stream of the ravines that lead to the dwelling of Ar, which lies at the border of Moab. I love things in history like this. When a work of literature is referenced like everyone knows what it is, and then is lost, and us in the modern times have no idea what they're talking about. The book is also cited in the medieval Book of Jasper, and it says it was a collaboration between Moses and Joshua, and contained a collection of victory songs that were written after the successful conquest of Canaan. When you hear the name L. Frank Baum, does this sound familiar to you? If you know him, you probably know him as the author of the Wizard of Oz books, much to his dismay. While the Wizard of Oz was his magnum opus, he spent many years after its publication trying to distance himself from its popularity. Baum enjoyed writing books for a more adult audience, and was attempting to break back into that market. He wrote a handful of books for an older audience, but had difficulties publishing them as no publisher would take them. Once he was finally able to get them published, they didn't sell well at all. In the meantime, demand for more Oz stories rose, as fans around the world began to write letters of Frank Baum in an attempt to convince him to continue writing. Seeing his popularity and finances being stretched thin, Baum continued his Oz series, and abandoned his other pursuits. We know of four books that Baum was in some process of writing, but they were never finished and released. We do know their titles, and they are as follows. Our Married Life, Johnson, The Mystery of Bonita, and Mary Odell. L. Frank Baum passed away in 1919, and after this, biographers searched through his files, where they found various file folders and paperwork on the four novels, but no manuscripts of them have been found, causing their contents to be lost to history. A lot of artists have pieces of their career missing. Mozart has pieces of his music gone. Michelangelo had one of his paintings soaking during World War II, and Da Vinci had his tank stolen. It's pretty common for an artist to have parts of their life missing, but what isn't as common is to have an artist's entire career missing. We discussed Sappho's poetry in the iceberg, but even she had parts, no matter how small they were. She still had parts of them available, but not a single painting made by Suxes is available to be seen. Suxes was a well-loved and renowned artist who lived in ancient Greece. His paintings were well known for being incredibly realistic, and great philosophers like Xenophon and Aristotle talk about them in their own works. When you're trying to be the best, you're gonna have detractors. And one of Zeuxi's detractors was Parhatius, another artist who specialized in hyper-realistic paintings. The two of them had a contest to determine who the better artist was. They brought out their paintings, and Suxis had painted some grapes, and they looked so realistic that some birds flew down and pecked at them. Probably with the biggest shit-eating grin on his face, he turned toward Parhatius, whose painting was covered with a curtain. He told him to reveal it, to which Parhatius revealed that the curtain was the painting, causing him to win the contest. I'd like to imagine after this, Suxis rushed home and tore up and smashed and burnt all of his paintings, causing them to be lost to history, as his well-renowned and beloved Greek artist had none of his portfolio survive. But I mean, he was known for hyper-realism, Maybe his artwork is out there, and we just can't find it. We can't tell the difference. My 1600 Greek viewers, I need you to go around smacking the walls or smack the grapevines. See if Suxi's hit a painting somewhere. And here we are, another 10 cases of historical lost media covered. But I have a list of, I think, like, what, 30 more entries I could talk about? But that's for another video, if you want to see it. 
But in the meantime, if you want to hear more about historical lost media, I have an iceberg covering 60 entries I'll have linked in the description and in the end cards. Also, my description is a link to my Twitter and Discord server. Join or follow if that's your thing. That's all from me. Thanks for watching and have a wonderful day.